Hi everyone, it's Alex here at Zestrian Capital Research. It's currently 5 p.m. Uh, on Thursday, the 8th of December. Uh, it's in time uh, for the benefit of the tape. So today we have our regular weekday webinar. Uh, delighted to welcome uh, many newsletter subscribers today uh, who we periodically invite to attend the webinar. Um, partly as a thank you for subscribing to the newsletter service and also as a sample of part of the additional value of the full Growth Investor Pro service. So I hope you enjoy the webinar, folks, if you're new. Um, the format we follow is uh, we'll deal with uh, disclaimers and so forth in a moment. And then uh, the agenda today is basically to run through the four major market indices. So that's the S&P, the NASDAQ, uh, the Dow, uh, and the Russell 2000. We look at those in the large degree over a multi-year time frame and where they may be headed towards year end and beyond. And we'll then zoom in and look at the smaller degree as to where they might be going in the next few days and why. We are then going to check in on sector rotation. So we track uh, the major sector components of the S&P in a bid to anticipate where money might be flowing to. So, you know, this year has obviously been the year of energy that appears to be changing going into 2023. And so we try and keep tabs on that. And then uh, we're going to dive into uh, one of the stocks we cover reported earnings uh, this week. MongoDB is a database software business, a uh, pretty remarkable uh, stock reaction up over 20% on the print so we'll look at why that might be and uh, finally we're just going to touch on uh, crypto so very specifically bitcoin and ether to see what's happening there in the light of the ftx situation um housekeeping matters so the way we run these things it's an open mic uh, system uh, we welcome questions points comments uh, agree disagree any of, the, any of those things uh, all you need to do is make sure you're unmuted on your side um, and then just shout out loud when you have a question or a point or anything at all you want to raise. Um, I'll pause uh, after each section to ask for questions, but feel free to interrupt along the way. And we'll also have time for questions at the end. Uh, the recording of the webinar will be available for Growth Investor Pro full service members later on. It will not be available for newsletter members unless you choose to upgrade, in which case uh, you can catch this recording and recordings of all of our other uh, webinars over the last year. We do two a week. Uh, which are available in the archive. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's deal with our disclaimer. So disclaimer, this webinar is intended for US recipients only, and in particular is not directed at nor intended to be relied upon by any UK recipients. Any information analysis in this webinar is not an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any securities. Nothing in this webinar is intended to be investment advice, and nor should it be relied upon to make investment decisions. Sestering Capital Research, its employees, agents, or affiliates, including the presenter of this webinar or related persons, may have a position in any stock, securities, or financial instruments referenced in this webinar. Any opinions, analyses, or probabilities expressed in the webinar are those of the presenter as of the webinar's date of transmission and are subject to change without notice. Companies referenced in this webinar or their employees or affiliates may be customers of Session Capital Research. Session Capital Research values both its independence and transparency and does not believe that this presents a material potential conflict of interest or impacts the content of its research or publications. Okay, let's uh, start by taking a look at the S&P. Uh, we're going to look, first of all, at the larger degree, just to catch up on where we stand in the, uh, in the zoomed out. Uh, view. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so uh, this tracks the S&P from the 2015-16 lows. Um, we get a, a wave one up peaking just before the COVID uh, crisis, a wave two down into COVID. Uh, we've overlaid on here the impact of the options market, which you know, coincide or, or rather are a driver of the major reversals. So uh, quarterly OPEX uh, option, major index options expiry uh, at the end of uh, the first quarter of 2020 was uh, put heavy. Uh, in other words, investors had bet big that the index would go down uh, ahead of expiration. It did in some ways self-serving because uh, as you'll know, if you follow our work uh, and follow uh, folks like Spot Gamma, you'll know that if investors are buying puts, dealers market makers are selling puts so dealers when they sell a put become long the market in order to stay neutral which is their job they have to short the stock or short the futures which in and of itself drags down the index when these options uh, expire at key quarterly or annual uh, dates you typically get a big reversal as the dealer 
positions get unwound. So if you've had a put heavy uh, quarterly expiry, you can expect to see some short covering uh, rallying. And if you have a call heavy uh, expiry, as we did at uh, the end of last year, you can expect to see um, uh, a bearish reaction because if investors have been buying calls, uh, dealers have been selling calls. Um, in other words, if you sell a call, you are um, short the market. And so to unwind uh, their positions, uh, I'm sorry, if you, if you, if you buy, if investors have been buying calls, investors are long the market, dealers have been selling calls, uh, so they're short the market to hedge that out, uh, they have to buy stock, uh, which in part drives uh, the peak up here. And as those hedge positions are unwound, stock and futures are sold, then the index falls off as a result. So this S&P pattern uh, is pretty interesting. It follows both fairly standard uh, Elliott Wave and Fibonacci projection levels. So wave two down peaks at the 78.6 retrace, uh, coincides with a put heavy options expiry, uh, then extends to a 1.618 extension of wave one, which is a standard wave three extension, coincides with a call heavy options expiry. And the wave four down so far has troughed just a little bit above the 0.5 retrace of this big move up. And so far that wave four down has marked the year's lows. Uh, we'll see, but uh, you, you know you can just see visually uh, that since that uh, October uh, low, this is a weekly chart, this is week of October the 9th, you can see a pretty marked move up in the S&P. Uh, and you can also see, not coincidentally, that the S&P has found resistance so far at the 0.236 retrace of that way three up. So again, pretty much to the dollar, as these things often are, uh, it found resistance at around 4.10 and has sold off a bit since then. So uh, what one would expect to see next, if the market is indeed in a more bullish mode now, is a, a retest of that 410 level. And if the market, if the S&P retests that, you know, three, four times and doesn't succeed in breaking through, well, it's going to sell off again. If it does push through and turns 410 to support, then that would be confirmation that we're in a, a wave five high that can uh, extend to make new, new highs over the course of the next year or two. So that's the S&P in the larger degree. Uh, we'll zoom in in a moment, um, but first we'll turn to the NASDAQ. We're going to use the QQQ ETF as a proxy for the NASDAQ 100. Similar story, really. Uh, we haven't included the um, options expiries on here, but the exact same story. Uh, put heavy down in early 2020, call heavy at the end of 2021, um, and put heavy uh, in the uh, Q3 uh, expiry uh, this year. So wave one up into the COVID pre-COVID highs, wave two down into the COVID crisis, 78.6 uh, retracement yet again finds uh, support there, moves up to a much more aggressive 2.618 extension of that wave one, uh, finds resistance there, tries, 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 can't push through it, sells off, um, and then so far uh, has found support at the 61.8% retrace of this wave three up, which again, uh, not a coincidence, that's a, a, a fairly uh, typical uh, reversal level. Uh, I should say support level to be found after a retrace. And you can see that it was tested again to the dollar uh, in the October 30 week. Um, and so far it's so that level, that 258 level has been breached once, tested twice, and then the NASDAQ's moved up since then. Again, we'll zoom in in a moment, but so far it's harder to argue right now that the NASDAQ is in a wave five up. If you look at the, the S&P, you know, again, just visually, you can see a very strong reaction up out of those October lows. And if you look at the QQQ, again, just visually, you can see it's been a much weaker response. Let's look briefly at the Dow, which has been the strongest index um, coming out of those October lows. Uh, pretty remarkable, actually. So the Dow now is only uh, a few points shy of its all-time high, uh, which is not something I think that's widely, uh, widely known. Uh, if it was, I think people would probably be a bit more bullish on the market at large because there's no particular reason why the Dow should be making new highs and the S&P and the Nasdaq be going to zero, uh, which is you know, uh, an opinion you will still find prevalent uh, on Finterit. Uh, the Dow uh, traces out again um, a fairly standard pattern, wave one up from the 2015, I think, lows, uh, retraces back down to 78.6 retrace of the COVID lows, puts in a wave three up to the 1.236 extension. So you'll notice that's a, a much shallower extension than for the S&P that hit 1.618 or the NASDAQ that hit the 2.618. Uh, 
and then a wave four down that uh, again was a more muted wave four down and that's found support so far um, mainly at that 38.2 reach rate so brief foray lower but you can see support there there and you can see a you know a, a big reaction up and out of that level in the uh, early october time frame um, and again the dow just a few points now below the all-time high so dow's performed very very well indeed um, and looks very much like it's in a way five up uh, to move on to make new highs we cover in the main service uh, index ETFs, uh, particularly the three times levered ETFs. So SDOW, S-D-O-W uh, is the long, uh, I'm sorry, UDOW, U-D-O-W is the long uh, 3X ETF and SDOW, uh, S-D-O-W is the short. Uh, at some point here, there's gonna be a, a nice uh, UDOW trade. So what we'd expect to see now is that this big move up for the Dow sells off um, some more, and we'll see that in the in a smaller degree in a moment. And we would expect that before too long, there'll be a very nice opportunity to go uh, long uh, 3x the Dow with that UDAO ETF, which which can produce really good results. Uh, let's look finally at the Russell. So this is the Russell 2000. It's a small cap index. The uh, the ETF is IWM. It's it's a it's a really difficult thing to chart. This is a bit of a mess in, in my opinion. Um, you, you, you can see this as a long wave one up and a wave two down into COVID, same as the others, wave three up, all that. But this wave one here, I haven't even marked it as such, takes an awfully long time to get there. And looking at the chart, it, I sort of wonder whether a better way to depict it is that we just get a, a new count starting at the COVID lows. And then we have a, a wave one up here and we're in a wave two down here. And we could measure how that looks. So I'm just going to clear uh all of this chart right here and if we decided that was the start of a new uh cycle because again it sold off if we look at the um if we look at the monthly we zoom out and look at the monthly um you know you you could say a wave one started at 2009 but and this is a wave two but I, it, it doesn't fit too well in my opinion so if you said this is a new cycle starting here and that what happened from 2009 uh, until the pre until 2018 is you basically had a you know a five-wave cycle up and then a sell-off down to here let's say we start the new cycle in the covid lows then if what we actually have here is a one and a two maybe that will help us project forward so that would be a wave one that would be a wave two to probably that's a low to there and if we look at the retrace, let's see if we can identify any uh, standard patterns it's retraced. I'm doing this live, by the way. This is not pre-prepared. So it's retraced. You know, that's a shallow-ish wave two. So again, the IWM is just a, it, it's a bit of a mess, in my opinion, to try and chart. It's, it's difficult. It doesn't fit the patterns the way that the uh, QQQ, the SPY, and the DAO ETFs do. Not, just not nearly as neat. Um, it looks like it may be turning up as we can see uh, and again uh, in the full service we, we have uh, TNA uh, that's the 3x long uh, Russell ETF that's that's a, an accumulate rated uh, ETF right now oh, we'll see how that goes okay let's zoom into the smaller degree so we're going to use the futures to do this and the reason we're going to do that is because futures trade uh, much, much longer hours than ETFs. They trade over Sundays, they trade overnight in the Asian session. And so for smaller degree movements, they give you a much uh, cleaner take on where sentiment is going. Let's do the S&P. Now, down here uh, in October, you've got the wave four low, the large degree wave four low. And so what we're doing here is tracking how it's moved up and out of that wave four low. Um, we changed this count a couple of days ago to accommodate reality. We, we called this here um, as a possible, uh, so this here is a possible wave uh, three, I think, high. Um, actually looking at it, it looks much more like that's completed a wave five cycle. So one up, two down, three up, peaking uh, at the start of November, um, peaking just shy of that 1.68 extension, a wave four down that troughs at the 0.68 retrace of that wave three, and a wave five up. Uh, that peaks uh, 1st of December this year. 
So this obeys most of the standard wave pattern rules. So wave three is not the shortest, the retrace levels are about right. And then we look to be in a down cycle here. And what we might see here, bear in mind, we already said that in a large degree, we're probably in a wave five up. So this is in the context of an overall up move. Uh, but right now, it looks like we are maybe doing something like this, an ABC correction, where we might see a, a B wave up now, and then another C wave down uh, before commencing another move up. So that's in the context of what we think is an overall rising S&P, but in the smaller degree, shorter time frames, uh, maybe a little bit of a move up now and then, you know, what, what will be seen as a big move down, but actually isn't really because it's still holding really nicely over those uh, October lows. If we look at the NASDAQ on the same basis, these are hourly charts, by the way. Um, let's look from the, uh, again, the, the, the November low in the case of the NASDAQ. Um, and it looks again as if we had a complete five wave cycle up here ending 1st of December. So one up, two down, that trough comes down to nearly the 78.6 retrace. We get a wave three up that peaks at the 2.236 extension. Again, almost to the dollar. So we, that's a fairly reliable wave three. Wave four down, shallow wave four at 38.2 versus a deep wave two. So that fits. And then a wave five up that peaks. Um, just a little bit above that wave three. So it's not the cleanest wave five in the world, but technically that, that does satisfy the conventions and the rules of this system. And then we have a sell-off that's retraced quite deeply down to the almost the 0.5 retrace of this whole one, two, three, four, five up. So that does look like a corrective move uh, has completed. And we think that the NASDAQ's on the way back up now. And if you remember, if we just zoom out to the uh, large degree for a moment. We'd said that NASDAQ has performed, of all of the major indices, it's been the weakest one coming out of um, the lows. So I'll switch this to the weekly bit. There we go. So we'd said that NASDAQ was the weakest one coming up out of the October, November lows. Um, it does look though that in the shorter term, uh, we may have some strength here. So perhaps we see NASDAQ catch up to the Dow uh, and the S&P, we'll see. Okay, let's look at the uh, let's look at the Dow. This is YM futures, uh, which is the Dow uh, futures E-mini futures contract. Um, the Dow, as as I said, has had a, the strongest of all the indices right up and out of the lows, and and the corollary of that is we're probably due a sell-off. Um, not in our house opinion, a, a scary you know sell off that's going to retest the lows, but just a, a normal correction. So this charted out quite nicely in the, the main service. We correctly called the top of the cycle. We said it would. Uh, we started back here and we said it would probably reach the 61.8% extension of wave one and three, which it did. Topped you know there to within a couple of dollars, and we've then said it will probably sell off after that, and it will probably sell off down to. You know, not less than the two, three, six retrace of this whole one, two, three, four, five waves up, and probably a bit lower. So, best guess there's a bit of weakness in the Dow yet before again a, a move higher. Again, in the context of we think it's an overall rising market, the Dow in particular, I think, is likely to make new highs before the other indices do. So, that um, idea about going long the Dow, um, in our house opinion, probably not yet, but when we think it, it is a good time, we'll say so in certainly the main service and probably the newsletter as well. Okay, finally, uh, Russell, uh, again, shorter term time frame. So uh, similar patterns happening a bit earlier. So it looks like five waves up uh, off of the lows completing middle of November. And then we've had this kind of strange sell-off since then. So a big drop, a gradual kind of reclimb, doesn't quite test the highs there, uh, and then it sold off uh, hard again uh, last week, this week. Um, Best guess, probably in a move up now, um, but you know we'll see. Again, it's it, the, the the Russell I personally find pretty hard to chart, much more so than the other indices. Okay, um, we're going to move on in a moment to talk about sector rotation and uh, MongoDB and some crypto stuff. Um, but in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, uh, now is a great time to to pile in. So all you need to do is unmute yourself on your side. Um, I see. Uh, we have one 
uh, hand raised um, by Radha. Um, the easiest thing to do, Radha, is uh, just unmute yourself and shout, uh, or failing that if it's hard, uh, use the questions tab at right, the system here, or even the chat tab. So I'll just type something in here. So I said chat here for questions. Uh, but audio is the easiest if you can do it. Okay, um, absent any questions right now, let's move on. Um, so we're going to talk next about uh, crypto. So you'll be familiar, no doubt, with the FTX uh, situation, which is a uh, debacle. Um, the remarkable thing is, if you look at Bitcoin and if you look at Ether, is that they they are holding up, you know, far stronger than really they should, if you think about it. So let's look at Bitcoin first. Um, Bitcoin. This is a daily chart. Bitcoin put in again because this thing trades on almost pure sentiment. Technical analysis works really well with it. So we use the Wave and Fibonacci method, but there's obviously lots of other methods that work. But generally speaking, crypto responds really well to technical because there isn't any there isn't any reality to it. it doesn't have earnings. Uh, it's pure sentiment. So Bitcoin puts in from the 2018 lows at the end of 2018 and Wave one up, two down. Familiar pattern now, peaks uh, uh, actually in the middle of 2019 and troughs right around the COVID crisis time. Huge wave three up, fueled by all the things we know, free money from the Fed, bored people at home gambling on crypto, uh, a 5.618 extension wave three, which is just crazy. Wave four correction, uh, which if we were to measure that, will... Yep, there you go. It troughs at a 61.8% retrace, so that's a classic wave four after a, a, shot, a, a deep wave two. And then a wave five, which peaks just a little bit higher than the wave three. So that's a valid one, two, three, four, five waves up or a large degree wave one. And then all we've had so far really is a wave two down. Um, you know, these are the June lows here around the 78.6 retrace. And this is after the FTX scandal. And we're still right around the 78.6 retrace. So all we've got at the moment is an absolutely standard big move up, wave one, big move down, wave two. You know, um, it's as if nothing, it's as if there's been no scandal, which is weird in itself if you think about it. If you look at Ether, Ether's even stronger. So here's Ether, uh, again, from the, in this case, we chart from the 2020 lows. Ether was a bit slower to take off. Um, one down, one up, two down, three up, four down, five up. So larger degree wave one peaking right around the end of last year, November last year. And then we get an A, B, C correction uh, down to the 78.6 retrace, uh, just yep, there. And then Ether has done the strangest thing since then. It's It moved up off of those June lows for a wave, smaller wave one high. It retraced down into a wave two low, just a little bit below the 78.6 retrace of that wave one up, and then it started moving up again. Now, if you know there was an FTX, you would say for all the world, that's gonna make a new local high um, above this wave one here, because that's the pattern that it's charting out. And because again, crypto responds really well to technical analysis. So if you knew nothing, you hadn't seen the news, then you'd say that Ether was headed to you know, 2200 or thereabouts. Um, which is hard to believe right now because that's nearly a you know that's nearly a doubling of where the stock price is or where the, where the coin price is right now. So we shall see. Uh, but the technical performance of both these things is remarkable in the light of um, what's going on in the real world. If we were to speculate, our house view would be that institutions are going to remain serious about Bitcoin and Ether, and that's mostly because the young people are serious about Bitcoin and Ether. Um, so that's a large addressable market for financial institutions to want to pursue. Um, that market will get larger as uh, younger people proliferate in the workplace, get older, have more money. Uh, their kids will be Bitcoin and Ether natives. And so this is a, a, a large potential future market that I think standard institutions, your Fidelity, State Streets and whatnot, don't want to miss out on. And so I think for that reason, um, these things are holding up pretty well. If you look at the long, 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 long tail of altcoins, they're doing much worse, but these two major cryptos are holding up pretty well. Um, we uh, cover 
the grayscale investment trusts um, in both Bitcoin and uh, Ether. And I just want to show you those right now. Um, the key issue here is that they are trading at a huge discount to net asset value. You know, if you're not familiar with that, um, investment trusts or investment funds that uh, have their shares trading on the exchange generally trade at a premium or a discount, usually a discount to the declared value of the underlying holdings. Uh, and usually they trade at a small discount. And that's because one, the fund charges management fees. And so um, if you own the fund as opposed to the underlying assets, then uh, you're having value drained out of you, so it should trade at a small discount. And sometimes if the assets are illiquid, uh, then investors will question the value that the fund itself has put on the uh, assets and therefore just, just aim off a bit. If the underlying assets are liquid and traded, it's, you know, it's harder to argue that. The issue with um, the crypto funds is partly, I guess, the underlying value of the assets that they hold. So, you know, what, what is the what is the price um, of one Bitcoin? What's the liquid price of one Bitcoin? You know, it's a little bit hard to say at the moment. Um, but mostly the question here is, do these funds in fact own the crypto they say they own? Um, what Grayscale hasn't done and has ruled out doing is providing the blockchain addresses for the coins it says it owns. Uh, they've had Coinbase, which is, uh, as you know, a public stock coin, C-O-I-N, uh, which is their custodian uh, of the crypto they own. They've had Coinbase come out and say, yes, 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 of course, they own this many uh, coins in, in these funds. Of course, they do. Uh, but no, we're not going to provide blockchain addresses for security reasons. So that could be true or it could not be true. No one knows. Um, what this is saying is that the Ethereum trust is trading at 50% discount to the net asset value. So that's like saying... The, the fund is saying we have, you know, pick a number, a um, billion dollars of, of uh, Ether, but the market is saying, no, you don't. You have uh, $500 million of Ether. It's a huge discount. It's not normal for trust to trade that, that, that level of discounts. And so these funds right now, you know, GBTC, which is the Bitcoin uh, equivalent, looks pretty similar. There you go. This is the combined chart of discount to NAV. So the Bitcoin's 47% under NAV, Ethereum 50 under NAV. So investors are saying the same thing about the Bitcoin uh, fund. These funds right now are somewhat binary in outlook. Either it prove, it's proved that they do in fact own the assets they say they own, in which case I would expect to see a huge snapback in the values of these things to the upside, or it turns out they've been misleading everybody and they don't own them, uh, in which case you could expect the values to plummet. So these are, there's huge potential upside in these things right now, but huge potential risk as well. Um, so if you're minded to, to start buying these things, you have to be aware of both the upside and the risk. OK, before we move on to MongoDB, any questions on the market at large or crypto? Again, if you have questions, um, easiest thing to do is just unmute yourself your side uh, and shout into the system. I'll be able to hear you. Uh, if you're a Growth Investor Pro member, a full service mem member, then by all means, uh, as always, use the use the chat room uh, and type the question in there, uh, and I can read out for everybody else's benefit. Okay, let's move on. Um, so MongoDB, uh, one of the stocks we cover, reported earnings uh, this week. Huge, huge, huge reaction. Uh, let's just take a look at that reaction right now, first of all. There we go. So this is a um, daily chart. Just going to move this a second. So yeah, as you might have guessed, this is earnings here, right here, and you get a 20 plus percent reaction um, to earnings. And you know, on first blush, so MongoDB, if you're not familiar, is a database software business. Been around a while now. Uh, it's basically the challenger to uh, older database uh, products like IBM DB2 or uh, Microsoft's database um, or Oracle's various databases. It's a very lightweight application. It was first used in uh, light but fast online applications and it's now becoming more prevalent in broader enterprise apps. 
Um, the business is a classic, you know, so-called unprofitable tech uh, company, which is to say it grows at a fair clip, but it's not cash generative and it hasn't been EPS, uh, gap EPS positive either. And what seems to have caught the market's attention on earnings is, yeah, partly revenue. Um, so, uh, you know, revenue was okay and you know, growth retreated from 53 to 47, but that's not unusual like software names right now. Um, management upped the guidance for Q4 by a little bit, but I mean, we're talking a full year increase of, you know, less than 5% on the guide for the full year. So it's hard to believe that the 20% reaction came from that. What I think it came from is probably that the company was previously guiding to be uh, non-GAAP EPS negative for uh, the financial year ending January 23, and they just changed that guidance to be non-GAAP EPS positive for the same period. And, and so I think what's happened is MDB has been moved from the unprofitable tech, bad bucket, to the profitable tech, less bad bucket. And so, uh, the stock's in a pretty interesting place. Let's look at the fundamentals, which you've got on your screen right now. So, you know, it, it's sort of so-so fundamentals. Growth is good. The, the notion that suddenly growth is going to plummet to 26% next quarter, by the way, looks a little bit far-fetched to me. So, you know, it, growth this year has gone 57% in April, 53, 47. So if we continue that trend, we might see it down to, you know, 40% growth, but probably not 26%. Um, it might do, but but that seems pretty cautious guidance to me. So I wouldn't be surprised to see it beat uh, that final quarter of the year, which is the January 2023 quarter. Um, back to the quarter just reported, gross margin takes up about 72%. Uh, EBITDA finally turned positive on a TTM basis, but you know once you knock off CapEx, changing working capital, all of that, you're still at negative 3% uh, cash flows, which is disappointing. You know, Nice to see this company generate some cash now, or you know, just even start to break even. Balance sheet strong, so um, a, a billion of cash, $800 million of liquid investments, uh, so that's 1.4 offset by uh, 1,100 of, um, uh, I'm sorry, 1.8, I beg your pardon, offset by 1,100 of, of uh, convertible loans. So net debt, uh, negative 650, 650 million dollars of net cash. Um, but because the, you know, there's this big gross cash number here, you know, it's a billion dollars of cash and it's not burning much cash now. So that's a very safe balance sheet. The debt's not callable anytime soon. Um, and so the balance sheet looks solid. Um, Deferred revenue at this company is pretty small as a proportion of trading 12 month revenue. They don't pre-sell much. And if you look at remaining performance obligation, that doesn't help you out much either. They they sell, it seems they most all forward contracts are prepaid, which is to say there's not much difference between remaining performance obligation and deferred revenue. Um, that's not a good thing. It'd be nice to see a big number in remaining performance obligation of sold but not yet invoiced or paid uh, contracts. Um, so visibility on this thing is not great. Um, and so, you know, this this company is more capable of missing a quarter than things like Viva Systems we talked about recently, where you've got huge visibility, you know, locked in customer relationships in a single vertical market. Uh, MDB can sell to, you know, pretty much any enterprise uh, or any even small business. So you have a big, big, big addressable market with big, scary competitors, uh, your Oracles and Microsoft just mentioned and others besides. And so customers are hard to lock in and therefore you don't have much in the way of prepaid long run contracts. And therefore you don't have much more in the revenue visibility and therefore there's much more risk of an earnings miss than for uh, some of those nice vertical market businesses. Um, if we turn to the stock for a moment, um, the, the chart has, it, it's broken from where it last found support. So this accumulate zone here we uh, defined as between the 78.6% and the 61.8% retrace of this whole large degree wave one up from the 2020 lows. Uh, and we'd said that put a stop zone below that 78.6 retrace on the basis that, you know, if you drop below a 78.6 retrace, something bad's happening. Well, something bad did happen. It dropped into stop zone. It's still below there. And so uh, in the main service today, we posted a note along the lines of that this stock is looking promising because the street just got a hold of this notion that it's going to be profitable soon and probably cash flow generative soon. But technically, the chart broke. And so 
a safer way to play this is wait for the stop to clear 200. That's that 78.6 retrace. Wait for it to turn that 200 into support, not resistance. In other words, let it bounce um, from above onto that 200 and let's see it test and bounce back up again. And if it turns that 200 into support, then probably there's a good long future, uh, a good long opportunity to invest in this stock. Right now down here, it's a bit anything could happen. So if you own the stock in long-term accounts, as I personally do, that's fine with me. I'm happy just to wait. Um, but uh, if you are thinking of buying it as a trade or a swing trade or a long-term buy now, um, you know, you, you can pile in right now, of course, but that's relatively high risk because anything can happen technically. Lower risk is wait to see if it clears and holds that 200. And if it does, then you know you're probably off to the races in a wave three up, a large degree of wave three up, which could run a long way indeed. So that's MDB. Any questions on that one? Uh, again, same uh, Patreon. So just make sure that everyone is unmuted this side. Yep, you are. So any questions or points at all, just unmute yourself your end and shout into the system. Go check our chat room to see if there's questions in there. Nope. Okay. Um, let's finish off with uh, sector rotation. So this is something we've been tracking through the course of this year. And the notion here is pretty simple, which is, um, let's make this bigger. Okay, one way to generate returns if you're a large account investor, and I'm, I don't mean you know, big retail, I mean a large, large account investor, is you can create returns out of nowhere simply by moving money around from sector to sector, from stock to stock. Because if you have enough money, then you can quietly accumulate a position in something, then start to less quietly accumulate a position, thus triggering momentum funds to come in and buy, and then in the end, retail to come in and buy. Uh, you'll have that stock running up, at which point you can start selling quietly and then selling loudly, at which point uh, the thing will dump. Um, and give you an opportunity to restart the cycle all over again. You see this in individual stocks for sure. You also see it in sectors. And one thing we've been looking at is uh, the longer and shorter degree moves in the key S&P sectors. So we've got tech, energy, consumer, and so on here. And if you look at how things have changed, we're going to do just year to date 2022 here. So uh, this is XLE, the energy uh, ETF. It, XLE Energy is the only uh, sector with positive returns in 2022. Remarkable. It doesn't happen very often that a single sector is the only one that's positive. Um, down here, you've got uh, comm services. That's things like AT&T, uh, Netflix, uh, which have had, you know, Facebook, which have had some issues. Um, that's year to date. Look at the last six months. The picture starts to change. So energy's weakened significantly. Um, healthcare has had a really strong performance. That's XLV. Com services still bottom of the pile at negative 18%. Now um, we get this short term effect. This is the last three months energy resurgence, um, consumer discretionary low as inflation, you know, inflation is going forever, fears really ramp. But in the last month, all change. Okay, so in the last month, energy is the only sector that's been negative. So this year, energy is the only sector positive last month the only sector negative and so this is sector rotation in action this is money coming out big money coming out of energy and going into other things and if you look at what it's gone into it's gone into um, utilities it's gone into uh, tech it's gone into uh, consumer staples it's gone into it's even going to com services a little bit so that's the last month and the last five days Same story. So energy negative. Um, and if you look at the relative strength here, uh, healthcare very strong again, relative to energy. So what you're seeing right now is, again, just to recap, last 12 months, energy was the only stock, only sector to own. Um, in the last three months, um, you see a resurgence of energy here. But in the last one month, energy is the only negative stock. So there's capital here. It looks like going out of energy into other things. And so we think that bodes well for uh, 
the growth stocks we cover for sure. We think that technology will probably outperform in 2023. Not all tech stocks, but um, the, the better quality companies, those are those which are either profitable or about to become so. Um, and we think probably uh, energy um, will have a, a, a tough, certainly a tougher time next year than last year. It doesn't mean you can't make money in the sector, but um, certainly tougher next year than this year. Okay. Any questions on sector rotation or anything else we've covered in the webinar today? Uh, again, if so, um, just unmute yourself your end and chat with the system, or if you're a full service member, uh, just use the chat room. Okay, pretty quiet tonight. Okay, well, that was all we wanted to cover on the webinar today. Uh, thanks for joining. Thanks for being a member of our services. We'll post the recording uh, in the main service uh, menu uh, later on uh, after it's compiled in a couple of hours time. Uh, for those newsletter members that joined us, thanks again for subscribing to the newsletter service. If you do want to upgrade, we offer a huge discount on the service, as you'll know from the newsletter system. Um, uh, we'll post a note about that in the newsletter in the next hour or two. And if you'd like to upgrade, um, we'd be delighted to have you on the other side of, uh, of the services. Thanks, everyone. And um, we'll see uh, full service members in chat later on. Over and out. Thank you, folks.